I have to commend Mark for reading the uh, the novel this morning out of scripture. I have to laugh as I was listening to it. There is one verse in there, um, believe it or not, if you want a little Bible trivia, the shortest verse in the Bible was in that reading this morning. We actually had the message version. Um, so in this version, it was three words. In all the others, it's two words. Anybody happen to know what it was besides Mark? Because he... Jesus wept. Jesus wept. The shortest, the shortest verse in the whole Bible. I, I saw that. It's like, oh, giving him 45 verses to read, and he gets the shortest one, little, little <laughs> snippet in there. I mean, that could have been my whole sermon this morning. But it's, it's, <laughs> will you come to prayer with me this morning? Embracing and loving God of so many names, we thank you for bringing us together once again this morning. But with each of us, we share that true spirit of Christ within us. Let us be that gift to one another through you and with you as we share ourselves with one another. Open our hearts and minds this morning, but let us be those receptors of the words that are about to be spoken. Take us and mold us and transform us and guide us through this message and let these words come to life within us. So I ask now that you would touch my lips of clay, mold them into the words that need to be spoken on this day and the words that come from my mouth and the meditations that come from each and every one of our hearts, let them ever be acceptable to you. In Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. So if you haven't been here for the last four weeks, we've been engaging in this series called Naked Truth, Revealing Resurrection. I just have to pause after that naked truth part. But during this time, over these last four weeks, we've been taking this journey through most of Paul's writings um, through Romans and Ephesians and also through um, some of uh, other texts that Paul's write. Um, we heard some texts out of Matthew, and as we get closer to, to Resurrection Sunday, we'll hear a little bit more out of Matthew. But we've taken that four weeks on this journey where it is letting us look at different aspects of our faith through the various avenues that we face in our day-to-day -day lives. We talked about relationships. We talked about just our gifts. We've talked about a lot of our avenues with our faith. So like it or not, there's this one thing in our lives that lives with us each and every day. It's called regret. Regret is that sad part of each and every one of our lives. Did you know that? How many times a day do you hear if only things had gone that way. If I had done this, if I had only not said that, that's a big one, right? Just listen to the people around you someday. Just take a minute, just sit there and listen to the words that come out. Oh, I should have done that. I call it the shoulda, woulda, couldas. But for that matter, <clears throat> we can't go back and change the things that happen. Can we? You can't unscramble eggs <clears throat> as much as someone has tried. And we understand, though we don't, we may not like it, but we may not know it, that it isn't some grand secret that we have regret in our lives. This is exactly why regret comes to the surface. We know that we can't change anything or make the past any different in any way, but sometimes that brings us sorrow. When things get difficult in life, what do we do? We lament over things, don't we? Well, we could have or should have, it should have been different. No. This especially becomes the case when we have death in our lives, and usually it's one of those, if I had only done this or said this, to that loved one, or if I only had done this, or if I had done that. And as it turns out in our attention this morning in the gospel, we, we hear Mary and Martha, in no uncertain terms, making their sinful regrets to Jesus. We hear, oh Lord, if, I, if you had only been there, none of this would have happened we'd still have our brother with us. Now, some of you will hear this and say, sinful? What about that is sinful? That's just the, the nature of human response, some would say. 
Even Jesus expressed regret when he cried at the tomb. Jesus did cry at the tomb, but why was Jesus crying? Does anybody realize that? That it was a sorrow of the expression of the regret, or was it regret? But I think if you look at it more carefully, he was expressing sorrow because of his humility. Jesus had to stand there and behold the wretched and deeply gripped that sin had had. And not only Lazarus being in that tomb, but everyone else around him who was mourning that loss of Lazarus that day. Now consider this for a moment. What regret truly is, I have to read that again. What regret truly is it, and may it help it answer the question. So is it really regret? Does regret answer the question? So I went to our friend Marion Webster and looked up to see what regret is in the dictionary. And it says, expressing sorrow over circumstances that are beyond one's own power to control or repair. Wow, we just heard that. Can't, can't do anything about regret. So in a nutshell, we express regret because we're not in charge, right? I think if you look at it carefully, when we express regret, we've lost all control. <coughs> and sometimes that brings the sorrow in our lives. You know, when you put it into those terms, you can't help but think of regret as sometimes being a sinful behavior that is spoken in the first commandment. When we learn that we should fear love and trust in God above all things. Our regrets in life repeatedly demonstrate the fact that we desire to be in charge. How many like being in charge? There better be more than four hands going up in here. I mean, come on. I mean, this, this is an MCC church. Come on. Our regrets in life repeatedly demonstrate the fact that we do desire being in charge and that we desire that fear and that love and that trust in everything else but God and God's word. Put this contrast into contrast with who had perfect fear, love, and trust in God. It was Jesus. So we heard this morning in scripture, Mary and Martha also saying, if you had only been there, my brother would not have died. But now while Mary and Martha have that sinful regret, do they still have their saving faith in Christ? Or were they doubting Christ that morning? In fact, Martha makes a confession, just like Peter's confession, proclaiming that Jesus was the Christ and the only Son of God. Friends, this knowledge can only be known and confessed by those of us who believe in that spirit and that first given wisdom of faith that comes to us. However, does having that saving faith mean that there is no longer any sins or any of that in our lives? Take a look at our own lives. Do you have any, anything in your life that is a saving faith that redeems us within our day-to-day -day work? Or do you sit there and regret everything you do day after day? I think about that, right? Do we all still sin? Of course we do. But at the same time, we know that we're, we're forgiven for those sins, or at least we hope we are. But we keep it through our faith that we keep our faith within Christ. <clears throat> It's because of mankind's sin and all of that defeating effect that comes with sin that moved Jesus to tears at the tomb that day. Jesus was not regretting the absence of Lazarus or the passing of Lazarus, but he was beating himself up in guilt by taking over what was going on. That it was taking an extra couple days to respond to Mary and Mother. Martha's summons to, to come, whatever. 
Christ sheds the tears because of the pain that brings in seeing the deadly and painful effects that sin has on all of our lives. It's simply part of regret. Christ experiences that great thing each and every day within our lives. So the point is, however, that while it may not be understood, you cannot by any old reason or any strength or any effect produce your own salvation. As much as we want to, we can't. Right? So for those of you out there that may think that this may not pertain to you, you're the perfect Christian, you life is complete, guess what? I have to think about that and go back and say, yeah, maybe not. None of us are perfect. I mean, this morning as I was trying to get out the door and make sure I had everything in the car because I'm uh, getting on a plane at 3.30, it's like, I had to go back to the house four times. It's like, oh, forgot my briefcase, forgot my sermon. Important thing. But, but my sermon was in my briefcase. It's like, okay, did I, re did I regret going back and forth the four times because I had to go all the way back up and all the way back down? Yeah, because I should have been a little bit more organized, you know. Um, some, some of the folks on the board, you know, I think regret sometimes when they go look at their email in the morning because the pastor's been up late working, you know, and they get emails at 1 o'clock in the morning because before the pastor goes to bed on a Saturday night and before he's traveling, it's like, here's the laundry list. So it's like sometimes I think they regret that they're on the board, but I hope not. But that's a different kind of regret. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they're, all, they're all asleep at one o'clock in the morning, as Mark says. But, um, but as I said earlier, Mary and Martha were in the rights of looking at Christianity. They were outstanding Christians. But yet, when they were confronted with that brutality and that ugliness of sin, they just didn't know how to deal with it. When, they got, when that going gets tough, they looked inward, seeking that situation and looking upward to God and trusting God's will. It was kind of like, okay, I'll throw in the towel. It's your turn. You take it over from here. It doesn't quite work that way either. You know, if only Jesus had been there when they had summoned him that Lazarus wouldn't have died. We don't know that. So I ask you this. Does this sound like something the person is... Uh, uh, God, it's one of those mornings. So I'm going to ask you this. Does this sound like something the person staring back at you from the mirror in the morning? So when you look in the mirror, are you, are you hearing the regrets in the mirror? Or are you... Yeah, it's a great day. I'm gonna go out the door. Yeah, I look pretty in the mirror. I'm like all put together. I can walk out. Or do you sit there and stare at the mirror and wonder what it's saying back to you in the morning? We do that sometimes. All I can say that does it sound like God? Are you going to take care of things today? Or do I have to rely on making sure that I'm like praying to you all day long to make things happen? All of these things we seek to control and put that trust that we have sometimes <laughs> gives us that false sense of confidence and insurance. But it's just that, it's false. Nothing that comes into our life <coughs> It's a done deal. There are mornings where you get up and you say, okay, you look outside and it's sunny. You know, of course, I can use Milwaukee now as an example. I couldn't use this example years ago in California, but it's sunny outside. Great. Plan your day. I forgot. I think it's Michael who always teases me. Five minutes later, it's raining outside. <laughs> Five minutes later, it's snowing outside. When the sun's back out. You know, our Milwaukee weather, you say, changes every five minutes or less or more. But do we regret that? Do you regret that 
you go out or you plan your day and you wake up and it's pouring rain and there's thunder and lightning and you kind of said, oh, okay, well, that got ruined. Thanks, God. Now what? <laughs> and you go take a shower and you get whatever you're going to start your day and the next thing you know, it's sunny outside and everything's dry. <laughs> okay? Can't predict that. So those regrets in our lives are things that God has promised to be there. God promises to be present at our work wherever we are. Breathing that life into the bones of us and breathing the life into the bones of, of Lazarus who was lying there dead, bringing him back to life. God's word and God's word alone is simply as it was stated that the word was made flesh within himself crushed to the power that held Lazarus in that tomb that day. All Christ did, simply did was called Lazarus by name, and the grave was completely powerless in holding Lazarus back. And as we heard this morning, Lazarus was in that tomb for four days. They were afraid to roll that stone back. God forbid what was going to happen if they rolled that stone back this morning and, you know, didn't want to get a whiff of that. <laughs> but instead, we hear that Christ called Lazarus by name. And he walked out, you know, wrapped like a mummy, but was human, was alive. No stench, no smells. We have to remember that Christ continues to come with us every day with no regrets, calling us by our names. calling us by our first names, like Mark and Diane and Bryce and so on. We all are called each and every day. So we kind of have that dead sleep silence of we've had a bad day and it's like we don't want to get out of bed. Think twice. Because Christ is calling our name and say, get out of bed. Live the day. Make it good. Don't have any regrets. All is good. Our lives move forward each and every day. And as we start going into the, into the next few weeks, as we start going into Palm Sunday, as we, I promise hopefully the reading will be shorter next week, but, um, <laughs> uh, but as, we, as we hear the stories over the next few weeks of Jesus' Jesus's arrival and, and the donkey and taking that ride through the, through the city, through the palm branches and, and the journeys that Christ takes over the next few weeks as we get to that re-resurrection of Easter Sunday morning. Did Christ have that regret? Think about that as we go through the next weeks. Was Christ being regretful that from Palm Sunday all the way through to, to Good Friday when he was placed on the cross? Was there that regret of being placed on the cross? us have to come in two weeks or next week, two weeks during Palm, during Holy Week and Palm Sunday and I just get the answer, right? As we start through Palm Sunday and as we go through, as we go to Wednesday and we, we celebrate the Eucharist and the resurrection of the gift that we have of the, of the meal. And mind you, you don't want to miss Holy Wednesday here at MMCC because it's going to be quite interesting. You have three pastors that are all in all attempting to make food of the of the first century was it the first century that we said? I was I, Bryce was with us yesterday, and uh, we were talking about um, what they just what they were discussing, how they were advertising Holy Week at Underwood. And I said, so what did Reverend Kate do? How did she describe what we were doing for for the potluck? Because we we had this lengthy discussion. I think I was t telling you all last week that when we looked at the foods of of Holy Week, they served eel. And all this other stuff, and you know, nothing, nothing that you would think that would be on the table according to Da Vinci and you know, all the paintings. So I'm like, oh, oh, great. So um, they didn't even have lamb. You know, we knew that they had bread and wine. You know, we'll have bread and grape juice, but it's an experience of thinking, what do you know? So I'm thinking, regret. Do I have to make eel? I was like, oh. <laughs> uh, you know, all the pastors, the three of us are looking at each other, and we're we're doing this over lunch, no less. And I'm like, oh, okay. So, but. But you don't, you don't want to miss Holy Week. You know, even though we're kind of like being a gypsy and caravanning around, we're doing it together as three congregations. 
We're starting with celebrating the Eucharist and celebrating the gifts that were given to us. And then having that feast, and as we put it, having foods of the first century, which are more like having Middle Eastern food. I think that was the best way we put it. And we were looking at who was going to, at least the pastors, who, was, who were going to make some of these things. And hopefully, you know, you'll all be creative as well. But then we go into Thursday. Did Christ have that regret on, on Monday, Thursday, as he washed the feet of those disciples, knowing that within less than 24 hours that he was going to be betrayed? And as we get to Friday and Good Friday and we, we go through the Tenebrae service as we put out the, the lights and, and become total darkness, are we going to regret being in that darkness? No. No. Because two days later, we come back and we, we celebrate that resurrection. So we shouldn't have those regrets in our life. We should know that each and every day that we're called by our name and we go forward. And that it's our very own life. And that we face God's world each and every day through that. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.